Hi there, I'm Andrea Koppel, and it's time for Coffee, the podcast where you get to hear firsthand what the jobs and careers that interest you the most are really like. Hey there, Java junkies. Welcome back to another episode of Time for Coffee. I hope you are caffeinated and ready to go because it is time for yet another caffeinated career conversation. And for those of you who may have already listened to the espresso shots, you know the treat that is in store because my guest is Guy Raz. Guy Raz! the host and the editorial director of the TED Radio Hour, which was launched five years ago back in 2013 and quickly became one of the most downloaded podcasts in the entire U.S. And during that time, or I should say in the intervening time, Guy decided he had a little free time on his hands. And so he is now the host of two other incredibly successful podcasts. My favorite, How I Built This, and NPR's first ever children's program, Wow in the World. I am so grateful to Guy to join me as I launch Time for Coffee. As an aspiring podcaster, I am so much in awe of what he and his team do and a huge, huge, huge fan. Guy Ross, welcome to Time for Coffee. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, Guy, as I had already told you for with the espresso show, Shots. The tagline is caffeinated career conversation. So I have to ask you, Guy Raz, are you still caffeinated and ready to go? I am caffeinated. I'm ready to go. I have now a half mug of coffee because <laughs> I've, I've been sipping the, the first half of it. Um, okay. Through your very generous introduction, thank you for that. I'm embarrassed because I don't. I, I always get uncomfortable when people say nice things about me. I really appreciate it. So, but during that time, I just drank my coffee to kind of get me through the anxiety of listening. Listening to you say all those things about me. <laughs> well, every single word of it is true, and I know that there are millions of listeners who who tune in because of just how authentic and how curious and how engaging and approachable you are. So thank you again. And because this podcast is all about helping Java junkies better understand the functions of different jobs, the ins and outs of various careers, I'd love to begin by asking you guys to get right into the weeds of what you do now as a host of those three shows, the primary functions of that job as host of three top rank NPR podcasts. Yeah, so my job changes from day to day, um, but in general, um, I I sort of oversee the editorial content of all three of those shows. Um, I come into the office, um, or I, I work from, uh, from from an office here. Um, on the West Coast, um, most of the team is is in Washington D.C., and we get together in the morning um, via uh, iPads, FaceTime, and um, some of the team is here on the West Coast, and we kind of go through what's going to happen during the day. So, in a typical day, I'll have one to two interviews for the TED Radio Hour, and usually um, one interview, one or two interviews a week for how I built this. Um, and so the TED Radio Hour is um, is a show that if you're not familiar with, we do, NPR does in collaboration with TED as in TED Talks. And, and we created that show in 2013. And the idea behind that show is to really kind of delve into what it means to be human. And, and it sounds a little bit hokey and maybe a little sort of naive, but it really is about this idea that all humans have a common set of experiences. We grieve, we love, we hate, we're joyful, we're resentful, we're jealous, we're curious, we're imaginative, we're collaborative. Like there are all these things that that differentiate us from other species. And so the idea behind that show is to kind of examine that. Like what is it that makes us human? Um, so I my my main job with that show is to kind of come up with every episode and I spend a lot of time watching TED Talks and trying to map out what talks might fit together and it's not always obvious so we don't, we wouldn't do a show let's say called you know um the arts and then just have five talks about the arts. It, it's much more sort of um, abstract. So we might have a show called um, why, we, why, why We Collaborate. 
And, and so one of the talks might be from somebody who studies ants and just describes how ants kind of work in an ant colony. And then somebody has a, convert, has a, a TED talk about um, the power of human collaboration in the workplace. So it's all we, – we try to sort of tie these different strands together and we try to take a multidisciplinary approach. So the hardest part of the TED Radio Hour for me is kind of coming up with, with an episode. And once I've kind of gathered um, – the the talks that I want considered for the show, I present it to the team and we kind of talk it through. Um, and that's how we create an episode of the TED Radio Hour. And then the team kind of divides and conquers. They'll start to contact the guests and get the guests into the studios. And over time, this can take you know anywhere from, from two weeks to two months. And our lead time on, on the TED Radio Hour is about three to five months per, per episode. Similar with how I built this. You know, we um, – I have a, a – now we have a backlog, but a very long list of people that we want to interview and that we've contacted and we reach out to them and then we book them. And usually the lead time now, right now, um, in the middle of 2018, we're booking interviews for 2019. So, oh, wow. uh, so the, 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 the backlog of, of interviews I've done is quite long and We'll get somebody into a studio and then um, either they'll come to D.C. or we'll do it on the West Coast or we'll do it remotely. And how I built this is a little bit different because we need somebody to block out two hours of their day for that interview. And it's usually somebody who's extremely busy. You know, it's 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 Richard Branson of Virgin or Howard Schultz of, of Starbucks. And what we say to them is, look, when you have two hours – uninterrupted that's what that's when we'll do it so um so we need that two hours in order to condense the interview to about 45 minutes to an hour so so how i built this is not just a straight unedited conversation it is an edited conversation um, but we need that two hour time slot to really dive into um, a deep conversation with with whoever it is. TED Radio Hour interviews usually last about 45 minutes to an hour. And there are usually four or five segments in every episode. Um, so I my primary job is to kind of lay out the um, the themes for all the shows I do mm -hmm. um, and then do interviews. And I also um, – work on scripts for Wow in the World, my kids' show that I collaborate with my, my co-host and co-founder, um, Mindy Thomas. And we usually record that show on Thursdays together. Um, and so that's a typical day. A typical day can just be <laughs> me running from one studio to another studio, um, quickly, frantically answering emails, um, running in and out of meetings because I'm also very involved in this sort of the strategic side of, of the show. So how I built this has many live. We do several live shows. We're doing a huge event in San Francisco in October, a one day summit. Um, so I'm sort of involved in everything from like, what kind of things are we going to give, give away in the gift bags? Um, you know, what do we want the signs to look like? I'm interested in that stuff. I don't always have the time to get into such granular details, but I love being involved in that side of it because mm -hmm. Um, it's fun and interesting. So a typical day for me is atypical. It, it always changes, but generally I'm doing between you know two to five interviews in a single day, um, which means I'm often in front of a microphone. To, so I'm I'm really interested in how you prepare for these various interviews. Obviously, with the TED Radio Hour, you can watch their TED Talk. Uh, do you read a lot of articles about your guest? And then during the interview, do you have prepared questions picked out ahead of time? How much of it is in the moment and how much of it is, gee, I really want to make sure that I ask X? You know, the, I used to cover the Pentagon when I was a reporter, and the military has a, a saying, which is, um, you know, something to the end. I'm paraphrasing, but it's like, um, you, you know, you, you expect the best, but you prepare for the worst, mm -hmm. or you know, the, the 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 it's something like, you know, all war planning goes out the window the minute the first shot is fired, right? So you plan and plan and plan and plan, but then once the war starts, those plans are obliterated. So it's very similar to to 
what I do, which is for the TED Radio Hour and for how I built this, I do a lot of reading and research for every person I interview. Um, uh, usually for TED Radio Hour, it's, it's at least – three hours, two to three hours of reading. For how I built this, it's can be five, six, seven hours, depending on how much is available. We do really, really extensive research on everybody we interview. And oftentimes I'll have a book. So I try to read parts of the book if I can. Um, the reason why I want to have such a comprehensive understanding of who I'm interviewing is because oftentimes, Andrea, most of us are really bad at telling our own stories. Like if, like I am not that good at telling my own life story. You might not be that good at telling your life story, but I'm really good at telling your life story. And I can really help you tell your life story and pull it out of you. And so in order for me to do that well, I have to be really, really steeped in in your life story as much as possible. Now, that being said, I always come to the interview with um, – a bunch of questions that I've written out. Then I also have just points that I, I, I know I want to touch on and hit on that I just handwrite on like a file folder. And then I come in with a timeline of, of that person's life. So I know that we're going to cover their life story in a chronological way. The minute the interview starts, it's very rare whether it's TED Radio or how I built this, that I go back to the questions that I've written down. Because once you hit a flow with somebody and once you're connecting with somebody, the interview has a life of its own. You know, there's there's rabbit holes you go down. And, you know, my curiosity may be piqued by something that person says. And in every single case, I'm learning new things about the person that I did not know from all of the records and documents that I'd read because there's some things about people's lives that just are not in the public domain that you learn about in the course of the interview. And that's, you know, that that's the most exciting part of these interviews, which is I know a lot about the person, but then we get into the interview and I'm like, whoa, I did not know that. I, that's amazing. How have doing these interviews changed you? Oh, in every way. I mean, TED Radio Hour has made me more empathetic. It's, um, it's made me think about my own life in different ways. It's challenged my, my views and my beliefs. Um, it's, it's helped me to reframe things that, that I've, I've wanted to kind of work on, you know, all of us are flawed, right? You know, so I have these shows and you hear them and obviously in, in the shows I'm, uh, you know, I'm at my best, I'm the best version of me. But in real life, you know, I, I'm in traffic and I get angry because I'm like, come on, let's move it, you know, or, <laughs> or um, you know, I'm in the supermarket line and somebody's counting their coins and I'm just like, come on, hurry up. You know, we all – we all have our things that um, that make us complicated and flawed, um, and 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 the TED Radio Hour has really helped me to reframe and to rethink about um, about about the world around me and about about flaws and about how to sort of step back and just pause and and um, and to appreciate what 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 I you know the the world around me and just being with my children or. Um, or the fact that I get to have these conversations, this conversation with you. It's it's those kinds of things that have been so important and meaningful for me um, through, through this job. The other thing is when you learn about someone's story, even if you don't agree with them, even if their political views or – or their own, you know, I don't know, their own worldviews just kind of clash with yours. You can't but help feeling empathetic with somebody when you learn about their life story, when you hear about the challenges they had as kids, when you hear about the doubts they had and the fears they had. It it humanizes them. And so it's made me a much more forgiving person um, as well. And, and not to say that I, I don't – I mean I – absolutely have moments where I am not forgiving and I can be difficult and I can be um, stubborn. But the the shows remind me to check myself too. And that's been really, really valuable. Well, everything you just said about yourself, I could say about myself. And I feel that your shows and listening to these stories have affected your listeners as well. So thank you for that. Guy, you are a former host of NPR's Weekend Edition, former foreign correspondent for NPR and CNN, which is how we came into contact with one another. You mentioned being the former Pentagon correspondent for, for NPR. 
Do you ever get nervous anymore before a big interview? Yeah, 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 totally. You do? I get nervous all the time, yeah. I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years and um, in, in this profession, and I get nervous – Man, all the time. I get nervous on stage. Um, I get nervous, and and now I sometimes speak in front of large audiences or or do live shows in front of audiences of like two thousand, three thousand people. Um, I get nervous every single time, and I feel like if I didn't, I would be complacent. Now, not to say that I'm I'm certainly jealous of performers who don't get nervous. I I, I wish I didn't, but it means that I spend a lot of time preparing and and really focusing on trying to do the best work I can. When it comes to interviewing people, um, I always get a little bit nervous, not about, not about, I don't, and I don't quite know how to explain it, but I think the, the nerves for me are about fulfilling the expectations of my audience. You know, I, I know the audience expects a lot out of the shows and out of what we're doing. And frankly, like they're giving us an hour of their time. Like if you are listening to my podcasts, that is an hour of your waking day. So you've got like 12 to 14 hours of the day when you're awake and you've got stuff to do. You've got to work. You've got to raise your kids if you have them. You've got to cook. You've got to exercise. You've got to do a lot of things. You've got to take a shower or whatever. You're giving me an hour of your day. That is a lot. That's a gift. And, and I need to make that worth your time. So I always feel a certain level of pressure to make sure that it's worth your time. And so that's – that's those are where the nerves come from. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I think it's really important for our Java junkies to appreciate that even at the level that you're at, this is all part of the it's part of the process. And yeah. I want to just flash back a little bit, not super, super far, which we'll do a little bit later, but to what happened your first night in Berlin when you were the brand new Berlin bureau chief for NPR. Could you share that with our Time for Coffee community? Yeah, I was so nervous. I mean, it, you know, I was I was very, very lucky. I am very lucky. My, my, the, the trajectory of my career has been luck. And when I was 25, um, I was very fortunate to become NPR's Berlin correspondent. Now, today that would be virtually impossible simply because NPR is a bigger organization. It's just way more competitive. But back in in 2000, when I became the, the, the Berlin correspondent, if you were an aspiring foreign correspondent, you wouldn't necessarily go to NPR. Even at that time, you would still probably pick the Boston Globe or the Baltimore Sun or the Dallas Morning News. I mean, it's amazing to think today that you would do that because those newspapers don't even have foreign bureaus. But at, at that time, you know, most major dailies in America had foreign offices around the world. So when I applied to be the Berlin correspondent, there wasn't a whole lot of competition. I was very young. I was very inexperienced. But um, the foreign editor at the time, he gave me a chance. And he gave me a chance because somebody gave him a chance when he was a younger reporter and he went and covered the Vietnam War. But I was so nervous because I I just thought I've I've – I'm a fraud, you know, I've pulled the wool over the eyes of all these people and they think that I can do it. And I got to Berlin and I was this kid, you know, I was, I I mean, probably, I looked even younger than 25. And um, in Germany, you know, foreign correspondents were these these distinguished gray haired men. And all of a sudden I show up as the NPR correspondent and people, first of all, didn't know what NPR was. And second of all, didn't take it very seriously because they thought, well, if they're sending this child here. And I was so nervous. You know, I I remember in, in, it was probably some, sometime in the first week, just throwing up, you know, just being at, in, in my little apartment slash office and just being so terrified terrified of mm. failing everybody and and of coming home in disgrace and of course that didn't happen i i it it pushed me to work so hard and to to work harder and faster and and and, and as much as i could and it wasn't that i was more talented because i wasn't and i'm not it was just fear i was just afraid of of letting people down people who gave me a chance and and that just motivated me to work so hard but certainly those you know those first few months i was really nervous and scared and uh, to the point where it made me sick yeah, that's awful. It's just <laughs> awful. I mean, it, you just want to go back and comfort that 25-year-old. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. really do because, holy cow, I mean, who could? 
step into that role at age 25 and feel like, man, I own the, I own this place. You know, of course, <laughs> everyone is going to feel that way. Yeah. Guy, I read an interview that you gave a couple of years ago, and you told a story about when you were still NPR's Pentagon correspondent, and you told your boss that you wanted a shot at hosting an NPR show. And it seems so ridiculous to think that this senior executive told you that you were too much of a military correspondent and didn't have the personality to host a show. Yeah, I mean, it was a real low point. You know, I and it's not it wasn't in any way this his fault. You know, he he was doing his job in the right way. You know, you as an executive of a news organization, your job is to make the best decisions quickly that, you know, will result in, you know, strong on air folks and, and very few executives are willing to take risks. I mean, I mean, even I even remember when I left CNN, I was at CNN for two years. We may get into that from from 2004 to 2006. And um, and at the time, I was a foreign correspondent. I wanted to come back to the U.S. because my wife, my my now wife and then newly married, we were newly married, needed to come back to the U.S. to start her career. And um, CNN uh, really said, well, we, we're only going to offer you a position in Jerusalem, which is where I was based, and I couldn't stay there. And I remember emailing at the time, there was an executive at CNN named John Klein, and I emailed him and I said, hey, uh, he was the president of CNN or something. And I, and I was a correspondent. I remember emailing him, um, saying, Hey, I, I would love to chat with you about opportunities in the U S and he didn't even reply, you know? Um, but that was a different world for me because I didn't really know CNN very well. Thankfully he didn't reply because I got to come back to NPR and, and have a second chance at at, at a career at NPR. But when I was the Pentagon correspondent, you know, I had a reputation at NPR, which which may seem odd now, but I covered wars. I covered the Iraq war. I covered Israel, Palestine. I covered the Balkans. I covered Afghanistan. Um, I was constantly on the road around the world. So, and then I covered the Pentagon and I spent so much time in Iraq that I had this reputation for being kind of a military, um, foreign correspondent, conflict zone reporter, which I know seems weird today if you didn't know that about me, but that was my reputation. And you know, oftentimes it, you can get pigeonholed in any profession. It's also possible to break out of those pigeonholes, and which I, I was able to do, um, but it takes work. And I think at the time that NPR was a place where, and in and, and any organization, there has to be a person who kind of decides who who does certain jobs. And at the time, the, the person who kind of decided who was the right, who were the right people to host shows was just a very kind of old school NPR person who had this sense of what it meant to be an NPR host. Um, and that model worked really well. You know, um, there's a reason why NPR was and is so successful. Um, and he, you know, he just felt that I wasn't, I wasn't the right person. Um, so how did you get to be a host? Well, it was really a crushing time for me because I didn't really know what to do. You know, I felt like um, I knew I could do it. I really in, in my heart felt that I I could do it and I felt like I could do it because I had been a foreign correspondent and I had interviewed such a wide range of people as a reporter. You know, as a foreign correspondent, you're covering sports and economics and politics and science. You're covering everything in your region. So I felt like I had started to develop skills that would give me an ability to host programs. Um, but what I what I did at that time was I really started to think about leaving journalism. And I started to look around and to think, well, maybe I should start try something new. You know, I was, um, you know, in my early thirties and, um, I thought, you know, I could still maybe try something else out. But this, what happened at the time was there was a really just fortunate luck, which was a colleague of mine at NPR, a guy named Frank Langfitt, who's still at NPR. He covers, he's a foreign correspondent, a wonderful reporter. Um, he suggested to me, that I should look into applying to the Neiman program at Harvard. It's a fellowship for journalists where you get to spend a year there. And I, I applied and I got it. And so I basically had this year <laughs> where this amazing year where I left NPR, got to take classes at Harvard all on their dime and just think about what I wanted to do. And in that year, um, I 
was able to host pr- NPR programs, but from the Boston station, WBUR. They have a show there called On Point, and that show is not controlled so sort of centrally, and they they were happy to let me guest host that show. So once I started to do that, they could hear that back at NPR. And then at NPR, they started to allow me to host occasionally to fly down to D.C. from Boston, host Weekend All Things Considered and Weekend Edition, and that was it. What happens is that oftentimes... And, and a lot of people listening to this may experience this, is that your own organization may not, may have a harder time recognizing what you're capable of until somebody on the outside recognizes it. It's, it's a very strange thing that, you know, people know you in your organization. They've known you for a long time. They have a different perception of you. But on the outside, people don't have those same perceptions. So it's once somebody – it's this very strange thing. The minute an outside group recognizes you or, or gives you a chance, your own, own organization sometimes says, oh, yeah, great, great. No, come back in. Do it here. So that's sort of what happened. And and eventually that, that executive left NPR, which is really – one of the reasons why I was able to 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 become a host, but you know, it it this is it happens. It's normal. I mean, it's it's not it's not anyone's fault. There's no one to blame. It's just you know, I just had to kind of. It was a combination of getting lucky and getting an opportunity, and then just pushing, pushing for it, you know, pushing for it in any way I could. But going to Harvard, thank goodness he didn't give you the host position right away, because then you wouldn't have gone and had that wonderful experience doing the Neiman Fellowship. A hundred percent. I mean, a hundred percent. And, and, you know, throughout my career, all of my failures and all of the positions that I really desperately wanted that I didn't get at NPR, I mean, thank God I didn't get those jobs because had I had, had I been given those jobs at the, at those moments or, or any of those jobs, I wouldn't be doing what I do now. I wouldn't have had a chance to leave the news world to try this out and to create these programs. So it all worked. I mean, it was all sort of very, very lucky. And I, I'm grateful in, in so many ways that, that that didn't happen, that I didn't get those chances then. Guy, I want to ask you about college. You went to Brandeis undergrad. Your major was history. Is that right? Yes. What were you going to do with that degree when you graduated? Did you know? <laughs> yeah, that was a question my dad would ask me all the time. My Both my parents are immigrants. They came to the United States with $500 and no English. And so to them, you know, the idea that they would raise a, a child – um, and they didn't have college degrees until they came to the U.S. And, and my dad got his degree in engineering. He didn't get his degree until his mid-30s. For me to go to college and study history was like this indulgence. Um, but I loved history and I loved I loved the, the intellectual rigor of it. I loved the learning. I loved the fact that history was just this very alive, living discipline because it always changes. Our interpretation of history always changes. And I think, you know, at times I thought about maybe I would go to law school. I thought that maybe uh, – but then as I continued with college, I really realized I didn't want to go to law school and that I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do but but – Actually, toward the end of my time in college, I did know I wanted to be a journalist, and I wanted to—I knew I wanted to be a journalist um, because I had done it in high school and in college. I was the editor of my high school newspaper, and I was an editor of my college newspaper, and was very involved in the college paper. But I didn't—I didn't really know how to sort of break into that world out of college, and I wasn't sure if I would be able to break in because I had applied for internships th- during my time in college to the Washington Post and to the New York Times, and the LA Times and the New Republic and the nation and I can go on and on and I didn't get any of them. I, I wasn't successful in getting any of those internships and I applied multiple times and back then you had to send in a letter and uh, and just, you know, wait and, and usually you got a reply in the mail that said, you know, thanks but no thanks. Um, oftentimes you got nothing. So I decided to go to continue my studies in history with the idea of maybe testing the waters to see to, to see if I, I wanted to go into academia, which is which is sort of what happened. And and I studied it. I went to, to the United Kingdom. Um, to Cambridge University to study history because I studied sort of colonialism, decolonization. I studied – I was really interested in in European colonialism and how – 
how that really shaped the world and in, in ext- as we know today in, in extremely negative ways. But so were, when you made the decision then to go to Cambridge, had you given up on journalism at that point? I don't think I'd given up on it because one of the first things I did when I got to Cambridge was join the newspaper there. <laughs> Um, but I think I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. And this was a really great option because at that time in the mid 90s, to study at the, at, at, uh, to do a master's degree in the United Kingdom was very inexpensive. It was, it was a time when the, the universities in the UK charged the same price to foreigners as they did to UK students. So I think it, it cost the entire degree and my tuition and housing and everything was like under $10,000 to get a master's degree. It was a very, very cost. I mean, it was relatively inexpensive compared to what a master's degree costs today. So it was almost like a chance to do something that wasn't going to break the bank. Um, I left college with, um, you know, considerable amount of loans that I had to owe payback, but you can defer it or you could at the time when if you continued your studies. And so I thought I'll test it out. I loved it. It was really fascinating. But over the course of that year, um, I sort of concluded that I didn't I, I wasn't going to pursue this, that I was still very interested in journalism. I s- s- applied to many, many internships during that year. I didn't get any of them. So I concluded at the end of my, my year doing a master's degree in history that I was going to go back to the U.S. I was going to go to Washington, D.C. because I had gone to high school there for a year as a congressional page when I was 16. I had lots of friends there. I was going to move into a group house in Mount Pleasant, Washington, D.C., for uh, there was a room available in a, a group house that my friend lived in for two hundred and fifty dollars a month, and I moved there in the summer of two of uh, nineteen ninety seven, and I thought I'll just find something, and I went to a temp agency, and I found um, some work as a temp. Well, what happened was I had sent an application to NPR to be an intern. Now I had been rejected by NPR before, and this time I had applied for a fall internship in 1997, and I never heard back. So I'm in Washington, D.C. in August of 1997, and I start a temp job doing data entry or something. I can't remember what it was. When my dad calls me, I think it it was like September 1st or 2nd of 97, and he says, hey, I got a message on my answering machine, right? This is 97, from somebody at a place called NPR, because my parents didn't know what it was. We didn't grow up listening to it. And he said, uh, and they said something about an internship, and he gave me the name, And the name of the person was Ellen Weiss and a number. And I called this number and this woman, Ellen Weiss, answered and said, "Uh, yeah, I saw your uh, I saw your resume here. I've got a stack of resumes and I'm interviewing people. Are are you interested in in doing an interview? And I said, yeah, in fact, I'm in Washington, D.C. She said, great. When can you come in? I said, I I can come in today or I think it was (laughs) tomorrow at lunch. I went down to NPR and I met Ellen Weiss and she was the executive producer of All Things Considered. And she hired me as the intern and I, it was $200 a week. So that was going to cover my rent. And I became the intern for All Things Considered in the fall of 1997. And that's how it happened. It was total luck. I mean, she had a stack of resumes. She was calling people, but I came in the next day. I was there. I was available. We connected and Ellen turned out to be the most important mentor in my life. She, to this day, I meet with Ellen once a month for coffee. Um, When I'm in D.C., I stay with her. Um, She went on to become the vice president for news at NPR. Then she became the head of the Center for Public Integrity. She's now the head of Scripps uh, News Organization in Washington, D.C. She's a really important mentor to hundreds, has been to hundreds of people. To this day, I consult with her when I'm facing crises or facing challenges. And that was it. That's how it happened. It was just total luck. The rest is history. (laughs) Yeah. Guy, if you could go back and do college all over again, based on the wisdom that you have now, what advice would you give yourself? I would give myself advice that I read Um, And I'm sorry, forgive me if people are listening and they're going to cringe. It's Chris Martin is the lead singer of Coldplay. And I know they're controversial. Some people think they're super lame. I think they've had they made some really good records and I I would I would defend them. Um, But I remember him saying that somebody told him to dance like no one's watching. Now, that's advice people have heard before. It's so actually so true. 
I wish that I went back to college with that in my head, not to be so concerned about what everyone thought or what I thought people thought. What you realize is people aren't thinking about you. You know, I think Eleanor Roosevelt said something like, most of the time, no one is thinking about you. <laughs> no one is, <laughs> like, no one is thinking about you. People are thinking about other things. So I would just kind of be less concerned about that. And I would be more of a participant in um, in, in just having fun and, and not being so so serious. And, and you know, I, I just went through a move, a house move, and I went through boxes and I opened a box and it's filled with letters from friends in college that we used to write letters. People used to write letters in the 1990s, handwritten letters and postcards during the summer. I mean, and I have a box full of letters and I was reading through them and it was amazing. I mean, I had really wonderful friendships and meaningful meaningful friendships in college. Um, I've lost touch with a lot of people, but reading back through those letters, it reminds me that I kind of forgot about how important that time in my life was just from a, just from a personal growth perspective, just learning about the world, opening my, myself up to new ideas, new music, new people, um, experimenting with ideas and, and thoughts. Um, and that, yeah, I mean, that was just, that's what I would, if I could go back, I would say to myself, just dance like no one is watching, you know, in every part of your life here, raise your hand, take part in, in conversations, say things that, that you might think sound stupid. Don't worry about what people think. Just, just go for it. So we're at the end of the interview and I have to ask you this question because this still happens to me and I hope it doesn't happen with our interview, but how frequently do you finish an interview or a couple of them during the day uh, for how I built this of the TED radio hour and you're and you're in your car and you're driving home and you think, shit, why didn't I ask them this? I can't believe I forgot to ask them about this. Oh, every day, multiple times. It's actually really great when that happens. I mean, of course, I don't feel that way. I always forget to ask things or always things I wish I asked. But it means that, you know. It, it you can never have a comprehensive interview with somebody. I mean, unless you sat down with them for a hundred hours and and, and wrote about to write a biography, it's just impossible. So I guess if there was a question that um, you forgot to ask me, I'm probably forgetting what that question is too because I don't know. Um, it's <laughs> it's it's hard to say. I mean, I guess I guess what I would say is that, and we've touched on this already a little bit. But it, to me, it's the most important thing that I want to leave people with, which is you can't um, – there's certain things you just can't control, right? You can't control generally like how good of an athlete you are. You can improve yourself. But like if you're an elite athlete, if you're in the NBA or in the in Major League Baseball, like that's just a, a level of, of – it's beyond talent. It's a gift that you have, right? But – there are things that you have a lot of control over. And two of those, to me, are two of the most important qualities and attributes that can help you succeed in life. And the first is kindness, and the second is curiosity. There's two things that you can work on and develop. Not all of us are kind all the time. We can't be. But we can try and push ourselves to be kind and to remind ourselves when we're not kind or we have unkind thoughts to recalibrate. It's really hard. I have, cha I have problems with it sometimes too, but... It's really important because it's something that you actually have agency over. You can actually decide to be kind. It's not a gift. It's not a talent. It's not – some people, it just comes easier. Some people are just really kind. They just came out of the womb, the womb that way. But we can control that and we can, we can improve on that. And curiosity. You can decide to just read stuff or just to open your mind or to have conversations with people or to listen to other people's thoughts and ideas. It's, or to travel places or to try new things. Like you can just decide that. You don't have to be born with that talent or gift. It's not a talent. It's a, it's something that you can do. And, and it, it's transformational. It is, these are the two things that I look for in people I want to work around. It's why our teams are so functional and successful because everybody is kind and everybody's curious and not all the time, but everybody strives to, to be and to do those things. And that's a choice. And so I think that, you know, every, if everything else I say, study this or do this internship or network, none of that is relevant in, in comparison to just 
practicing kindness and being curious. Guy, thank you so much for being kind and curious and for making time for coffee with me in the Java Junkie community today. You are a tremendous journalist, tremendous podcaster, but I think even more, you are a tremendous homo sapien. (laughs) Uh, Thank you so much, Andrea. It was a real pleasure. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to Time for Coffee, where the professionals in the jobs that most interest you always have time to grab coffee 24-7, no matter where you live. I have one quick favor to ask you. Remember to rate, review, and subscribe to Time for Coffee. Thanks so much.